it now. Hello, everyone. My name is Alejandra Tejada, and I will be hosting this session on behalf of Hispanotech. First of all, I want to say thank you to Try for providing us with the means to bring this together, together through their online platform. I'm going to uh, send a poll for you to answer, please. Uh, sorry, but I can I cannot. There's something happening with the poll. Thank you. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to remind you to write your questions in the Q&A panel, and at the end of the session, we will have 15 minutes to answer, answer them. I'm really happy that we have Andrew and Antonio to talk about immigration, diversity, and multiculturalism. Antonio is the Canadian Hispanic, Hispanic Bar Association membership director and lawyer who helps business owners to manage their operation costs by organizing employment relationships out of COVID-19. Andrew is the head of economic immigration as well as the area leader of our Latin American group. He received a Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts, Bachelor of Law, and Bachelor of Civil Law from McGill University, and he was called to the Bar of Ontario in 2011. So with no further ado, I will now start with Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, Alejandra, for the introduction. And so far, everyone can hear me okay and they can see my screen, right? Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, a mixture of two things. Uh, on, at first, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Canadian immigration and who was allowed to work in Canada and maybe the road to permanent residence and citizenship. This might be of interest to some of you if you have not, if you're not Canadian citizens yet. And then we'll take a look a little bit at the ethnocultural diversity of the city of Toronto specifically. I mean, we might look at some Ontario um, statistics, but we want to we want to look at Toronto. I mean, obviously, this is a mentorship program of a group, uh, certain groups of organizations that cater to an immigrant community. And I wanted to I want to look at a little bit of the statistics of how immigrants do in the labor market in Toronto and uh, basically how multicultural our city is. Maybe before we start, Alejandra, we could do the first poll to get an idea of what's the status of people um, who are participating. Sure. Mm, I just launched. Okay, so we have a lot of permanent. Oh, interesting. There's quite a mix. Okay, I think we have, let me just write down the number. So we have around 36% people who are workers, 17% PR. Okay, so actually this might actually be more relevant to a lot of people, citizens, 14% and then other. Um, I guess it could be visitors, it could be students, or they could have another kind of, of status. Um, okay, perfect, thank you. So. Canada, as many of you know, and obviously a lot of you have uh, work permits uh, or they're permanent residents and, and you've gone through an immigration process before, has two types of residents, temporary and permanent. So on the temporary side, we would have visitors, we would have students, and then we, we would have workers who could either be uh, with a work permit um, as professionals or they could have a work permit as part of the job uh, of a company that they own. So they might have created, for instance, an affiliate of a company that they have in Canada and gotten themselves a work permit through that company. Then the objective of, I'm thinking many of you or all of those who are already there have arrived at this point, um, is to become a permanent resident. So someone who's allowed to be in Canada indefinitely um, and is allowed to basically do work, study, be unemployed if they need to be unemployed or do whatever they need uh, to eventually and eventually transition to citizenship. Uh, so for permanent residents, there's programs at the federal and at the provincial level. I know that some of you have navigated them already. Um, the, most of you, I would imagine, would have navigated economic programs for permanent residents. Uh, 
And those are the ones for skilled workers, for instance, or uh, some of them for, for business people. There's programs for people who do family sponsorship. So they could be sponsored by their spouses. They could be sponsored uh, by a, a parent or a child. Uh, there's humanitarian routes. So that could be people who do refugee cases, uh, do humanitarian compassionate cases. And then there's also provincial programs as well, uh, mainly for graduate students, for professionals in most cases with a job offer, and then for entrepreneurs. So I don't want to make this too much of a lecture on immigration, but obviously we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I want us to focus mainly on, on the second part, which is the one that appeals to me the most. And it's a great segue to what uh, Antonio is going to be talking about later. So who's allowed to work in Canada? I think that's one of the requirements, uh, or at least when I was involved with the, Canadi uh, the CCPA, uh, um, I we knew to be able to participate in this mentorship program, you would uh, need to be authorized or legally allowed to work in Canada. Uh, the first thing that we look at is whether what constitutes work, right? Uh, work means an activity for which wages are paid um, and that it's in direct competition with activities of Canadian citizens. So a good example of something that's not work is what a lot of the people who made this event possible do, which is volunteering, right? So sometimes volunteering might not be uh, counted as work because it's not something that's paid. Um, and maybe uh, you might be in Toronto uh, visiting a family member um, on, a, on a parental super visa and you're here visiting uh, and you want to volunteer for Hispanotech, for the CCPA, for Javierianos in Toronto or in Canada, um, go ahead. Um, normally you can do that. Um, that normally is not considered work. Obviously, if you're being remunerated, it could be considered work. There's been some court decisions um, that have um, decided that if, if something is a very competitive internship or, some, or even a, a position that's unpaid but brings prestige to the person or, it's, or can help them in the labor market, uh, even if it's not paid, it, it, it could be considered to be in direct competition with the activities of Canadian citizens or permanent residents. So you do have to be careful there. Just because you're not remunerated doesn't mean that it's not necessarily work. And who's allowed to work in Canada? Canadian citizens, permanent residents, and foreign nationals who have a work permit, which could be employer specific. So of the 36% of you who are workers, uh, some of you might have open work permits. Um, which are because you're a spouse of a worker or you've done your studies in Canada and now you're in a post-graduation work permit um, or you're the spouse of a student. But there's also some employer-specific work permits. So you have an employer and you obtain a work permit um, to work for them, be it because they did a process of proving that there's no one in qualified in Canada to do that job, which is called a labor market impact assessment, or uh, you're exempt from that maybe because of a free trade agreement or something like that. Then there's a very small select group of people who are allowed to work in Canada without a work permit. Um, that's set up, I mean, I don't want to be too technical here, but it's set up by section 186 of the regulations. Um, for instance, international students are allowed to work certain hours without a work permit. There's some members of, of the clergy who can do that. People who are on a, on a business visit or athletes, for instance, who might be competing for a short period of time in Canada. So for those of you who are workers, um, or other, I'm not sure exactly what the other could be, but I mean, it could be maybe some kind of temporary residence as a student or something like that, where you will be, or you, you might want to become a permanent resident in the end. Here's kind of a preview of some programs that you might be able to navigate to become a permanent resident. Uh, there's three main ones for skilled laborers in, uh, at the federal level. So one of them is the federal school worker, which is for people who have experience anywhere in the world. That's the one that we navigate with most of our clients who are not in Canada. Then for those who are already in Canada and have completed at least one year of Canadian work experience, which I think it's probably what many of you are going to be navigating, it's called the Canadian experience class. And you need to have a certain level of English or French. And then there's also a program for people in the skilled trades. So we're talking about carpenters, we're talking about uh, butchers, uh, cooks, uh, you do need to have a job offer, a certification from the province to be able to navigate that. Okay. So some of you who are here on work permits, this might be what you're eventually looking to do. Now, since 2015, it's not so simple to, uh, it, it's become more and more complicated to apply for Canadian permanent residence at the federal level. The main reason being that the, uh, the government introduced a system called express entry. It's not a program. The programs are still the three that we've talked about before, but it's a system to kind of decide who gets to apply for permanent residence. Think of it, if you're going to a club at a party, uh, there's a bouncer at the door, right? That's the person who determines who they're gonna let in or not. 
express entries like the bouncer at a party. Um, they decide who they're going to invite to apply for permanent residence and who is not going to. Okay, and uh, this invitation is not as arbitrary as a bouncer at a club could be. It's based on points, and these points are are going to be awarded based on age, education, work experience. Um, if you have Canadian work experience, it's more points. If you have Canadian education, it's more points and language skills, which are going to be very important. So you're going to upload a profile, declare all those different things, get a score. And then normally every two weeks, uh, there's a draw. There was one today uh, and the government invites those who are best qualified or the top 4,200 candidates, the top 3,500 candidates. And then they get an invitation to submit an application for permanent residence uh, through one of the federal programs or if you've been nominated by the province for some programs, you can do it there. And before COVID, six months or less for 80% of the people, they would get their permanent residence. Um, it's difficult. It's not easy to be competitive these days. Uh, a lot of factors. Canada is a very popular country. A lot of people like to immigrate here. Uh, another country where a lot of people used to immigrate because they thought it was a dream to immigrate to has been more of a nightmare, especially in the last four years. So a lot of people are deciding to not go to the U.S. and come to Canada instead. Um, big impact. I mean, we've really seen a big impact of what's happening in the U.S. Uh, for people moving to Canada, getting jobs in Canada, opening companies in Canada. Uh, and that unfortunately has made it more difficult for, for people to, to navigate Canada's immigration programs. If you're not in Canada, if you're coming from outside of Canada to be competitive under express entry, so you haven't worked or studied in Canada, normally you have to be 32 years or less, two degrees, uh, three years or more of work experience and an excellent level of English or French. Uh, now, if you have English and French, then you can get more points and things like that. Uh, those of you who are already in Canada, let's say you're in under a work permit, you have the one year of Canadian work experience. Some of you might have Canadian education. Some of you might have a spouse with Canadian work experience. It might be a little bit easy, um, but it's still uh, fairly competitive. Uh, for those of you who might not get the points uh, through express entry, you can navigate sometimes provincial programs. In most cases, they require for you to tie, have some kind of tie to the province. Um, so basically it could be a job uh, in the province or you've studied in the province or sometimes you've worked in the province. Um, so that makes them easier to navigate. Excellent alternative to express entry. Some of them are, many of them actually don't, are not point based. Although the more and more competitive that the provinces get, the more that we're moving towards that. Ontario, for instance, had an, an amazing program that I really like that where you don't even have to write an English test. You don't even have to uh, have evidence of your education. It's mainly having a job offer in, in an occupation that you've um, been working in. If, if you're an international worker or if you're an international student, you don't even need to have any work experience. But it's become so and so competitive and so difficult to get a, a spot in this program that next year they're going to make it also a competition. So unfortunately, that's what happens when we have a lot of people. But this is another way to, to get um, to permanent residence. And these programs are, are constantly changing. Then we, we do a lot of applications for entrepreneurs as well. Uh, there's provincial programs to invest. Um, well, actually, there's only one for passive investors, which is Quebec. But there's a number of ones for in the other provinces for those who are entrepreneurs and are basically uh, opening the, uh, a business or buying a business in Canada. And then there's uh, federal programs for startup visa, uh, self-employed individuals, but this is only for athletes and uh, people in, the cult in cultural activities. Uh, and then we do work with a number of entrepreneurs who are able to set up a company in Canada or buy a company that already exists and they'll be able from that um, to, um, sorry, someone is asking a question. I'll, I'll get it. I'll get to it in a second. And they, so they set up a company or they it could be, or they buy a company or it, they could be uh, setting up, for instance, like an, affi a, a, an affiliate of the company that they have in another country. They could be a business person in Mexico who's setting up. Uh, an affiliate of their company in Canada. We help them get work permits and those work permits give them a, a very, like a, a high number of points that they'll be able to navigate a provincial, uh, federal program for permanent residence. So Jorge is asking us, being a citizen will give your brother an advantage to apply for, the, for residence. So yes, this is correct. So under express entry, one of the things that can give you points is if you have a sibling and it could be a half sibling or it could be a, a direct sibling, um, so basically half brother or a brother or half sister or a sister and, and they are a, a citizen or a Canadian permanent resident and they live in Canada. So that's 15 extra points that can make someone a little bit more competitive. And now citizenship. So we have 36% of you who are permanent, uh, sorry, workers, 
17% of you who are permanent residents. So most of the people here are not Canadian citizens. And I'm thinking some of you, if you've been in Canada and you like it and you've been able to survive the winter and, and it's, it's not going so bad, then you might be thinking that you want to become a Canadian citizen at some point. Uh, so I wanted to chat briefly about those requirements. Uh, the first one is that you need to be a permanent resident to become a Canadian citizen. Um, there's a physical residence test, so that's very important. You need to have lived in Canada for a number of years, um, physically present in Canada to be able to uh, become a citizen. It's basically three out of the last five. Um, there's limited exemptions for not being in Canada and counting as physical presence, but you really have to be working for the government, for a provincial or federal government, or be uh, uh, the spouse of someone who is. Most people have to be physically present in Canada. And there's also something great, which is if, if you were on a work permit, for instance, um, you can count that time up to a maximum of one year, and then you only need to do two years after permanent residence. Um, but the time before permanent residence counts for half a day. You need to have filed taxes if required for three out of the last five years. So they always look like at a five-year period. Uh, you need to have a certain level of English or French, which is not very high. It's kind of like a basic level. Um, but if you've studied in English or French, then you're exempt from having to prove uh, to write a test or, or do a course. Uh, you need to, if you're between 18 and 55, um, sorry, 18 and 54, uh, you uh, will have, have to write the um, test on rights, responsibilities, and knowledge of Canada. And then um, you cannot be subject to any prohibitions due to criminal offenses. So some serious offenses or that, uh, that, that could uh, um, restrict you from becoming a, a citizen. Um, but most importantly, if you're serving time, if you're on parole, uh, if you're in prison, um, then that time is not going to count uh, towards uh, residence in Canada for citizenship. Okay, um, switching gears. So I just wanted to kind of like do that, the brief introduction into like some of the immigration status that ex uh, statuses that, that exist in Canada, uh, transition to permanent residence, which I think some of you are heading that way. Um, some of you might be looking for jobs to be able to head there eventually, and then citizenship. And then maybe um, before we go into this kind of interesting, or I find it interesting at least, I've always been, I, I have a, a background in statistics and social statistics before, doing law. So I always find social statistics interesting. Some people might not. So I, I appreciate that that might be the case. Um, but I wanted to kind of like look at an ethnocultural diversity uh, study of Canada and how immigrants are included, especially in the city in Toronto. I didn't prepare this. I took the, uh, this uh, from the Chief Statistician of Canada, Anil Aurora, who prepared this. Um, but I want to look at a, at a, a few um, numbers with you. Maybe this might be a good time, Alejandra, to do the second poll. Um, and then, because I think that one has to do with like the, um, at least the language of the people speak who are participating. Sure. So uh, the third one I have, the years living in Canada. So it's not the okay. one to Yeah, have. sure. Let's do that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so a lot of recent immigrants, zero to three years. And I'm guessing that would be mainly on the mentee also body of the program. Uh, okay, I think we have most people answer. So 65%, zero to three, 17, four to six. And then we have the all timers, 10 plus. So that would be 11%. Okay, so the great majority um, has been here actually zero to three years. Okay, that's that's interesting to know. And uh, we'll take a look a little bit about how those statistics affect uh, people's uh, job opportunities and things like that. Um, and I think there's another question that I have, the one of language. Uh -huh. Okay, let's do that one then. Not surprisingly, what I expected given the uh, organizations that put together this mentorship program. Um, wow, interesting. So no English or French is mother tongue. Uh, we have Spanish at 83% and other. Um, so people who uh, first language would have been another one, which is not one of the two official languages of Canada. Okay, excellent. Um, let's keep that in mind. Um, so 83 and 17% um, of mother tongue. Let's take a look at statistics of our city, okay? Our, of Ontario and of Toronto. Um, we're, immigrants are very important to the growth of Canada in general, and also the growth of Ontario. If we look at, um, population increase, 
uh, over the years. Um, from people, um, from the natural increase is, is, is well, I mean, it's fairly stable and like, uh, I mean, it's not a very, uh, it's not very high. So, I mean, we're looking at around 50 something, well, last year, and it's actually going down. So that would be like the purple line that you see there under 50,000 uh, of natural increase. This means people having children and then being born in Ontario. We have some interprovincial migration, which goes up and down. So people who are coming from other provinces within Canada or territories. But the big boost to, to Ontario's um, population is migration. Big spike in 1988 to 1989, big spike in the early 2000s, um, and it's spiking since, been spiking since 2015. Obviously, this year is going to be interesting. I mean, I feel like for statistical purposes, we have to just like erase 2020, uh, 2020, or we're probably going to have to do the same with 2021. But um, what we can see is that the immigrant population in the province is going up. Now, this is a statistic that many people have often seen, um, and it's it's very telling, like that we live, or, I mean, most of you, I think, are, are in Toronto or, or the greater Toronto area. Uh, we live in a city where almost 50% of the population is considered an immigrant population. Um, so basically they were born in a different country. So they were not born in Canada. That is very, very telling. I mean, most of you are Spanish speaking. So most of you, I'm guessing you come from a Spanish speaking country in Latin America. Uh, it could be Spain as well. Um, and, and that's not the case, right? Like, I mean, when we went to school, when we would, uh, those who went to university in those countries, most people were born in the country, right? Where they, they, they were not countries with like a big population of immigrants. Now you might be from Argentina, for instance, where there was a big wave of immigration um, back um, earlier on. But like, I mean, most people that you knew were from your country, right? In Toronto, most people, or almost most people, 46% are born elsewhere. And then obviously we see in the big metropolitan areas, there's a big chunk of immigrants as well. So Hamilton, Windsor, Guelph, London, um, and then outside of uh, census metropolitan areas, that's where it gets more non-immigrant population, less than 10%. What's, this is another interest, it's interesting statistic, at least for my, in my view, because of what I do, I mean, I do economic immigration at our firm. I basically specialize. I don't do refugee cases. I don't do uh, humanitarian cases. There's other people who do that. So I am the one who does the, where the bulk of the immigrants are coming from. But the other reason I like the statistic is because it, re I think it refutes a lot of stereotypes that are out there. Uh, when people think of immigrants, they think, oh, it's just like people who are coming to Canada who don't speak the language and they're, they're coming through refugee uh, programs or humanitarian programs. And some of them are, but um, that's, it's really not the majority at all. Most people who are coming to Canada are economic immigrants who have been like very carefully selected for, the fac for factors that will make them um, very good at transitioning to, to permanent residence, right? Um, and we, and it's, it's, it's sometimes funny because I see how someone who's born in Canada, like they don't even have all the factors that the immigrants have to be able to become permanent residents of Canada. So that's where most people are coming from. Um, trying to stay within, yeah. So, uh, source of the country. So we're definitely, I mean, and we and I'm referring now to Latin America. Uh, we're not a big source of, Im of, of immigrants. Most of them, you would expect, are coming from Asia, uh, which would include China, I mean, would include India, Southeast Asia, and all of that. Um, here in the map, we, we can get a better idea of where the immigrants from Ontario are coming from. Um, this was based on the 2016 survey. Uh, from South America, only 5%. Uh, Caribbean and Br Bermuda, we have 6.2%. A lot of those go to Quebec as well. Some of them are French speaking. Central America, 1.8%. But we're definitely in nowhere as represented as Southern, uh, Southeast Asia would be Southern Asia. Uh, Eastern A Asia um, and and uh, some places of Europe uh, as well. Mother tongue of the Toronto population. So people who were born in Toronto, what is their mother tongue? English, but not, I mean, it's a majority, but not a huge majority. So 55.5% of people born in Toronto speak English as a first language. Some of them might also be the children of immigrants. So they learn another language first. Very few French is the first language. Uh, of those who are immigrants, so basically people who immigrated to Toronto, only 26% of them uh, had English as a mother tongue, but it's still, I mean, over a quarter of them 
and 0.8 French and 73% other language. Uh, in terms of how are the different languages represented in Toronto, this is more like a, a visual representation. We don't have numbers there, but we can see obviously Cantonese and Mandarin, uh, very high, very big. Uh, then we have people from Southeast Asia, Urdu, uh, Punjabi, uh, very well represented as well. Arabic is, is it's a big bubble too, but Spanish is is not bad, right? Like I mean, we we see um, it it is language that's very um, often spoken uh, in Toronto. And then uh, this is a graph that I actually really like. It, it goes to show how multiculturalism is act, sorry multilingualism is going has been going up over the years. So basically, it shows us people who only speak English in the Toronto area. Uh, at different periods in time, 2006, 2011, and 2016. Uh, people who, who spoke a non-official language only, so no English or French in those three periods, and that's actually going down. So with time, more people do not, um, do not speak an official language. And then what's going up, which is great, is um, um, multilingualism. So people speaking English and, and a non-official language at home. Um, that's getting up to 50% in 2016, and that's going up. So, so it's great. I mean, we're seeing people speak English, but also, I mean, they're, they're keeping another language um, that they have. Uh, religion, um, no religious affiliation going up. Um, that's something that's interesting. I mean, I think it's to be expected. I think uh, people, um, they're definitely more not really, I mean, it could be either agnostic, it could be either atheist, but also like not practicing. Uh, Catholicism. So a lot of the um, non-Christian religions are going down, uh, have been going down been between 2011 and what's projected 2036. Some non-Christian religions are expected to go up. So we see, for instance, like Muslims, um, Hindu are expected to, to increase uh, from up to 2036. And those are obviously, uh, I mean, in part due to the waves of immigration that, that we're getting in Canada. Uh, visible minorities group in uh, visible minorities in Ontario, and again, this is all self um, identified, right? So a lot of people might say that they're not Latin American or that they're not a minority, but of those uh, who have um, said, so Latin Americans are less than two hundred thousand. Most people, South, South Asian Chinese, are or those who are considered um, minorities. And then this is uh, something that I really find interesting for, for a number of reasons, uh, based uh, only, I mean, in part because it, it shows us to what extent being an immigrant might not be a disadvantage or not a huge disadvantage in Toronto if you're a man, but not if you're a woman. Um, so basically here we see employment rates of different groups. So first we have all immigrants. Um, then we have recent immigrants. So this goes to that question of, I was asking zero to three years, four to six. Um, so basically the, the small dotted line is recent immigrants, less than five years in Canada. The, the dotted line with the period is established immigrants. So at least 10 years in Canada and then Canadian born men. So Canadian born men, uh, employment of around 90, but not much of a difference with, with, between those who are actually well-established immigrants. They actually seem to be a little bit higher and even those that are recent immigrants, I mean, it seems like their employability is going up. So that's good news if you're a man, uh, not as good news if you're a woman um, or identify as a woman. Uh, Canadian born women have a much higher um, level of employment than, than, I mean, than the others. So basically uh, even than established immigrants, but much more significant than re recent immigrants. I think that's something that, and a statistic that you look at and you think policy needs to be implemented to fix that. Because I mean, the difference between 82% or whatever it is to 52% is, is significant, right? Um, and, and I mean, hopefully this, this will change over time. It seems like it goes up and, and goes down, um, but we definitely see that unfortunately women are, are hit more. Uh, when um, in terms of like employability because of their immigrant status. Uh, we also see a larger proportion of immigrants in low income uh, jobs. Uh, so basically we have there the proportion of non-immigrants in low income jobs around 10%. Uh, when it's immigrants, we have double that 20%. And then this is basically getting into the territory of my good friend Antonio, which is immigration reported in Toronto in the last five years um, and basically they're, they're in, in, two, in three cities, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, um, and basically different uh, 
reasons for why um, people were discriminated. So ethnic, race, language, or religion. Um, I love how the language one is super high in Montreal. Uh, I lived in Montreal, that's where I studied, and I, and I know that people are very much um, discriminated if they don't speak French in, in certain uh, places. Um, and so, I mean, that definitely tells a lot about Quebec culture. But I mean, we see high indices of, I mean, we're, we're talking about one out of six immigrants reporting discrimination in the last five years. So that's something serious, obviously something that we're, hopefully will um, get better over the years. And, and Montreal definitely seems to be higher than all the other places. Um, and and I, I mean, I think that's kind of like what I wanted to look at with you. Um, talk a little bit about immigration which is what I'm an expert in, talk a little bit about um, statistics of immigrants in Ontario and Toronto, and now um, we'll look at it from a legal and story-based perspective uh, with Antonio. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. I, I love the stats and, and it's interesting that, um, and we need to change it, but, but from, from local female to um, local, male in jobs there is about 10, 10 points difference um which which we need to work with um and and try to change all right i'm gonna share my screen just give me a second And please let me see, let me, um, let me know if you can see my, my presentation. Let me switch it. Can you see my full presentation? Yes, we can see. Thank you, Lucero. All right. Um, Alejandra, can you help me with the, the fifth poll? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. In the, in the meantime, Alejandra, can you see the presenter slide or can you see the full slide? I can see the presenter slide. The one that has like a white and black background or just the, the one with? I have the one with the picture. Okay, okay. So you don't see comments there. No. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so I see here that uh, most of you, 89%, uh, responded all of the above, harassment, stereotyping, and bullying. And the answer is, it depends. So a little bit of a difference between what, um, what Andrew was talking about and what I'm gonna be talking about is that I'm gonna be talking about human behavior in the workplace. So. It's very difficult to measure, it's very difficult to separate it, uh, uh, one thing from the other. So for example, a stereotyping or bullying and harassment and what's not harassment in the workplace. But let me tell you a story first. Um, this is the story of uh, Danny. Uh, Danny enjoys entertaining family and friends over the weekends. Um, and every Monday when, when Danny goes back to the workplace, um, Danny tells the story of what happened over the weekend and, and the way that they enjoy a barbecue and, and music and so on. Months pass by and, and Danny's coworker, uh, who doesn't have the same background as Danny, uh, started to be a little bit too friendly during, during those summaries of what happened over the weekend. And, and Danny started to get a little bit concerned because this coworker was being a little bit too friendly, hugging, um, uh, getting too close, touching. So <clears throat> the coworker was also making comments like, you people surely know how to party, eh? Or I know how to have fun too, let me show you. Um, let's go out after, let's meet after work. Or I can help you with your future in the company. Um, you know I can help you. So 
<clears throat> we're going to separate the, the conversation now in, in two things, harassment, uh, which is not a fun topic, and sexual harassment, which is a, a less fun topic. Um, and then we're going to talk about how to navigate it. But a but, um, uh, word of caution for everybody. Uh, the things that I'm going to be talking about now are not that um, uh, nice to experience. These are difficult circumstances, but most workplaces in Canada are uh, nice, great workplaces to work um, and, and enjoy your, your work experience. So we're going to be talking about the exception. <clears throat> Let's start with harassment. Um, three things I want to say about this word harassment. Harassment is against the law. Um, and some of you said harassment, stereotyping and bullying. Maybe a stereotyping and bullying can get into the harassment sphere, but harassment is against the law and employees have the responsibility to maintain employers have the responsibility to maintain a workplace environment that it's free from it, free from harassment. Um, the second point is that not everything is harassment. Sometimes we have an interaction in the workplace that seems to be a little bit um, uh, some sort of a, a bullying behavior, but it's not. A reasonable action taken by an employer, a manager, a supervisor relating to the management and direction of the workforce um, sometimes is not uh, workplace harassment. And the third thing that I want to say about harassment is there is no clear distinction between what is harassment and what is not harassment. And, and those three points, um, I think that will drive what um, uh, I'm going to say, the def I'm going to say the definition now. I don't want to get technical either, like, uh, like Andrew said before, but just to say the definition of workplace harassment means engaging in a course of vexatious comments or conduct against a worker in a workplace that is known or ought to be known as unwelcome. All right, so there are three parts in this definition. Let's start with the easier one, against a worker in a workplace. So first, um, to be talking about harassment, illegal harassment or against the law harassment, you need to be a worker and it needs to happen in a workplace. Now that we're working from home, and, and in different places, uh, you, you, can, you can tell that workplace, the definition of workplace is very broad. Um, but that's what harassment is in the workplace against the worker. The second piece of it is engaging in a, in a course of vexatious conduct or comments. That's a, a, the word vexatious for me um, just explains how uh, tricky this definition is, but it needs to be a course of conduct or comment or comments, which suggests that it's more than one. However, one it depends on how how bad the conduct or how bad the co the comment is that um, uh, these these one comment or one conduct could be considered as as harassment. But usually, it needs to be more than one. Vexatious. Vexatious is an an act or a or a, or a co um, I mean a comment or a conduct that tries to annoy the person. So it's done to try to annoy the person. However, harassment doesn't have to have intention. So if I'm the harasser, it doesn't matter if I've intended or I didn't intend to um, harass you, making that joke that I thought it was funny. It doesn't matter what my intention was. What matters is the consequence of that bad joke that I, that I told that actually hurt that person who was receiving the joke. So a course of um, vexatious comment, a course of vexatious comment or conduct. And so that's the second piece of the definition. The third piece of the definition is that it's owed. So known is a conduct that is known or owed to be known. So let me explain that with an example. Let's say I'm a harasser, I'm making a joke, and um, the person that I'm telling the joke, I'm, I'm making a joke about Latin American people. There you go. So I'm telling a joke about a Latin American uh, person and, and the person who is receiving the comment is Latin American and gets offended. The person who gets offended says, the comment is not welcome. I don't appreciate it. So that's pretty straightforward. It says the person who is making the joke 
knows because the person who received it actually told the, the harasser, right? It gets a little bit more complicated when there are no words. I make the joke, the person gets offended, and the person who got offended walks away. By the action of that person is suggesting that the comment was not welcome. That's the O to no part. So in the workplace, it's, um, harassment is a very delicate uh, set of circumstances that we need to be paying attention to so it doesn't escalate. And that's, I think, the message that I would say at the end, that we want to control the escalation and we're talking about human behaviors. And I'm going to give you a couple of points. So here are a couple of examples of, of conducts that may be considered as harassment or as bullying, maybe a stereotyping that, that could be considered as harassment, offensive or inappropriate comments, teasing, jokes, innuendos, or taunting stalking, inappropriate physical contact, physical verbal abuse. Uh, these are just examples, but because we're talking about human behavior, it could be anything under the sun. That's harassment. Look, in, in Canada, and I like to believe that this is the case, we take harassment and we take sexual harassment very seriously. So it doesn't matter who the person is, whether the company, um, and it doesn't matter what the company is, harassment should not happen in the workplace. And one of the news that are coming out um, uh, now, and it's unfortunate that the um, governor general's office is under investigation for some complaints about harassment. That doesn't mean that, it ex that harassment actually happened, but now they're going through that investigation, which by the way, every employer, um, uh, let's talk about Ontario, every employer in Ontario um, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act which is the legislation that deals with harassment, one of them, um, uh, has to conduct an investigation for any incident or complaint of harassment. What that investigation looks like is a different question, but they have to conduct an investigation for every incident or complaint about harassment. If it's small, if it's big, it doesn't matter. They have to conduct an investigation. All right, let's move to sexual harassment. And sexual harassment, uh, the definition is similar, but it includes more nature of people involved. And it's going to make sense in a, in a second. But it's basically um, sexual har harassment could happen peer to peer, so coworker to coworker, or it could happen from the top down. So as um, a person who has the power to grant uh, or to deny, let's say, a promotion. And, and the definition changes a little bit when, when you are in those circumstances where I'm, I'm, let's say I'm an intern and I have this senior person who is um, trying to help me in uh, advancing my career, right? So the, the first one, coworker to coworker, is pretty much the same, sexual harassment. Engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct against a worker in a workplace um, and that conduct or comment um, is known or all reasonably to be known Antonio, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to know, are you changing the slides? Because we are not, not seeing anything moving. Did you see the examples of uh, harassment? No. no. Just listen to it. Okay. I'm exactly. Sorry. All right. And then we had this news about the private council, uh, the investigation, and now we move to sexual harassment. Do you see no, it now? We are not seeing anything. We're, we just... Uh, we have a, a slide, uh, like your introductory slide, and nothing else is happening. Interesting. Okay, let's see. I can do the sharing, Antonio, for you. So, on what slide are we? Oh, can there. You, can you see it? Yeah. Now we, I can see the 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 notes. Uh, the. Yeah, the you just need to change the settings. Yeah, the play settings. Mm -hmm. What about now? Which one can you see? I uh, can see the picture with the people running. Um, there's uh, little guys running. And do you but, see notes or you don't see notes? I yeah, don't we see notes. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, we, we see it. the notes. We can see the we notes. We can see everything. Okay, let me change it. And now? And nothing new. We we still seeing, seeing the same thing. All right.
Alejandro, can you tell me what, what do you see now? I still think the same, the, the one I told you, and we have the notes still. So there's no, there's no changes at all. That's weird. Okay, let me stop. Yes, and... sure, Antonio, I can do it. I can do it for you. Okay, that's weird. Give me a Thank you. And the drawings were really fun. Yeah, sir, no, we're then so let us know, Antonio, where you want to. So we can go to, 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 to the police officer. There you go. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry that you missed the the other um, fun cartoons over there. But anyways, so let's get back to sexual harassment. So workplace sexual harassment, uh, as I was saying, the, there are a couple of definitions. One is engaging in a course of vexatious comments or conduct, or to reasonably be known, to be unwelcome, that's coworker to coworker. And, and the sexual harassment, workplace sexual harassment involves whether um, a conduct or a comment related to sex, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. And, and it's interesting with sexual harassment that um, it's so important for us here that um, it's, it's um, uh, protected or uh, controlled or regulated by two very important legislation, two very important laws, Occupational Health and Safety Act and Human Rights Code of Ontario, which also the Human Rights Code of Ontario also deals with discrimination um, in the workplace. The second piece of the definition of sexual harassment is what I was telling you about um, that uh, person who has the power to grant or to deny um, some benefit. So making, and it's a specific for making a sexual solicitation or advance uh, where the person making the solicitation or advance is in a position to confer, to grant, or to deny a benefit or advancement to that worker. And on top of that, the person who is conferring that uh, benefit knows or ought to be um, knows that that um, advancement is unwelcome. So let me explain you uh, with an example. Let's say that I'm a senior, uh, I don't know, a, a senior lawyer in, in the law firm where I work and uh, there are interns. And one of the intern, uh, I'm, I'm uh, closer to one of the interns. And I, at the end of, a, of the um, working week, I invite that intern for dinner and then dancing. And then I start asking questions that are inappropriate, but we're not in the workplace anymore. Um, the definition of sexual harassment under the Occupation Health and Safety Act is telling me as a senior employer, as a senior uh, member of, of the organization that I should have not done that. I shouldn't have even, even gone to dinner and then to dancing and then so on. There are other ways to help our um, uh, co-workers or our uh, employees. All right. So I'm going to read now um, because uh, Lucero, you don't have this slide there. Um, it's some examples of conduct that may be considered as sexual harassment. Um, asking for sex in exchange for a benefit or a favor repeatedly asking for dates and not taking a not for an answer. So those of us who, who say, well, uh, he or she's just playing hard, but I know that he or she will go on a date with me if I insist. And I've been told no many times before that's, that could be considered as sexual harassment, uh, posting or sharing pornography, sexual pictures, and so on are also uh, considered about uh, sexual harassment, bragging about sexual, sexual prowess. All right. Another example that happened recently in in Ontario, unfortunately, is from the police service. Uh, the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario found that the Toronto police officer endured significant sexual harassment on the job. This was a, a decision from from right here in Toronto, the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. And um, what usually happens with uh, sexual harassment is that it could go in in two ways. One. It is uh, an investigation conducted by whether an internal investigator or an external uh, investigator, or it goes to the Human Rights Tribunal in a form of a complaint. Again, as I said before, it's um, uh, sexual harassment is so important for us 
that it doesn't happen in the workplace that the Occupational Health and Safety Act and the Human Rights Code of Ontario deal with both. Now we can move to the next uh, slide. Thank you. So how can we navigate um, harassment and sexual harassment or sexual harassment in the workplace? First of all, the, the one thing that we want to recognize is communication. And, and um, Andrew was telling about all the languages that we have in, in Toronto and in Ontario in general. And I want you to uh, think about, well, if we have about 200 different ethnic uh, um, origins in, in, in Toronto, for example, we have 200 in, uh, uh, ethnic origins in Toronto, um, local ethnic origins and from all around the world, do you think that we were we have the same upbringing that we had the same education that we had the same um uh religious um understanding political views we actually don't the the challenge with that is that um these things are not visible we cannot see how a person was um, um educated or their religion or not religion views their social status we don't see that what we see are things like food and music and i'm i'm, I'm gonna put a uh, silly example here so i'm i'm able to listen to my my salsa music my merengue my my rancheras my vallenato but uh, but then i hear some bollywood music and and I understand that they, that this is a different uh, uh, expression, artistic expression that I I'm not familiar with. And then I'm okay, and, I, and then I can integrate to that um, expression because I know it's different, and I know why it's different. The same thing with food. We we know that uh, we don't have uh, chicken curry in Latin America, or we have it in a different way. But um, but then when we taste it, uh, we know that it's different. We see it, we, we, we taste it, and, and we can understand why it's different. In the workplace, when we're communicating, that doesn't happen because we're going to respond, we're going to react to things in, in the ways that we know how to do it, and the other person is going to do the same, and then miscommunication happens. If we are aware that we um, don't see everything in uh, how a person is reacting, how a person is answering, uh, then uh, maybe we can control the miscommunication a little bit better. And um, if we move to the next slide, Lucero, I, I can tell you why this is important. So remember that we were talking about harassment and sexual harassment, two things that should not happen in the workplace that is not fun that it happens. And we also ask about in the in the first um, uh, poll, we also ask what it, what's illegal, uh, what's against the law, harassment, uh, uh, or or bullying or stereotyping. So the 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 word that is actually against the law is harassment. But the thing is that bullying, stereotyping, another thing that happens is microaggressions. Uh, I think that you've heard microaggressions before. Um, all of those things can escalate to the point that it becomes illegal, that it becomes against the law. And that's why we need to tackle the workplace culture. If you have a gossip full, if you're in a gossip full workplace environment, um, it is more likely than not that it will escalate to harassment. Um, if you have um, a workplace environment where there are a lot of jokes, which are very welcome in some circumstances, but there are not uh, in other circumstances it's not, probably you will um, see that it will escalate to a point where it becomes harassment. So it's important to uh, recognize those uh, signs. But the question here is, when do you do something about it? When do you have to say, it's not welcome, this is not... I, I always invite, um, I always invite our, our um, uh, people to tackle the um, comment or conduct right away. Saying things like, um, I don't welcome that uh, joke. I don't appreciate it. Please don't repeat that um, comment. Please don't repeat that conduct right away. Because one of two things will happen. The person will feel, the harasser will feel um, uh, that he or she did something wrong and will fix it. 
or the person will not care. But now you know that the person doesn't care and you're in a work environment that it's very challenging. So tackle it quickly, um, the sooner the better, because at the end of the day, if you are uh, planning to work there for a long period of time, you if you don't tackle that right away and the person repeats that uh, contact or comment, you're gonna experience a very miserable uh, two years of, of work. It's gonna escalate, it's not gonna uh, stop. And, and the consequences, I, I don't wanna uh, tell you what the consequences are because it's not um, uh, fun, but uh, tackle it quickly. Focus on your workplace culture. Try to help the workplace culture um, in a way that things don't escalate to harassment. And that way um, you're gonna have a better experience in the workplace. Um, I think that that was the last slide and I'm open for questions. Um, and I think that Andrew too. Um, great, and Antonio. Thank you for the presentation both. And uh, now we will move to the Q&A. So I'm just gonna read the one question we have right now. And it says, do you know if the CIC is processing PR normally for federal skill workers? So if they're processing federal school worker applications? Um, yeah, they, they are. I mean, everything is delayed these days um, because of COVID, because of people, um, officers moving remotely. Um, and there's, I mean, some applications more than others, but they're definitely processing permanent residence applications, um, including federal school workers, including Canadian experience class. We've seen some movement on our clients. Uh, files, but but obviously the six months is if, if it's through express entry, it's really not happening anymore. Uh, we're seeing approvals and applications that we submitted around December. Um, so we're seeing more like 10 months or stuff like that. Something that this question touches on is to is, is whether because what happened for a while between April and kind of like July is that the government was only inviting people in the Canadian experience class. And they were doing that purposely because they assume that they're in, Can in Canada. Um, and they didn't want to invite people who are outside of Canada because of the travel restrictions. So if the question is referring to that, they are now inviting people under the skilled worker uh, categories as well. Thank you very much. And uh, there's another one, and I think that's the last one I'm gonna, we're gonna answer. I have a niece 26 years wanting to immigrate to Canada. I'm PR currently processing my citizenship. Given the current conditions, what's best for her Federal Express Entry Program or Ontario Provision Program? Okay. I don't want to sound like a typical lawyer, but I would need to do a consultation. Like a, a, a paragraph about someone, it's, it's impossible for me to conclude everything. We kind of like meet with someone for like an hour. There's more than 80 programs to immigrate to Canada. Um, someone young who has like good education, good level of English and, and, and work experience might actually be a federal program, but you might have to check. Sometimes people have to come to study to Canada first. And, and just so you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm okay if, one, if Antonio is okay as well, like staying five more minutes if you want. Uh, Perfect. You to so the next one is, how about the stage one? Uh, I don't really get Yeah. So stage one, probably of reopening, I'm guessing. That might be more to Antonio or, or, or yeah, I don't know. Or stage one approval of something. Yeah, the person who wrote that question can uh, give us a little El bit of Elaborate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then and I can definitely get to the other one. Someone who's a PR wants to bring their wife to Canada. How can they do that? Is there a program for that? Absolutely. There's a way to sponsor a spouse of yours to become a permanent resident. And there's a way to do it within Canada and outside of Canada. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Andrew and Antonio. It was very interesting uh, webinar. It was great hearing about all the immigration possibilities that people have to come to live to Canada and its processes, as well as the importance of having a correct uh, workplace behavior. Uh, before uh, we say goodbye, I just want to thank you all for being here and remind those who are participants of our mentorship program, please do not forget that our midterm event is coming soon. It will be on September 29 at 7 p.m. Please remember this event is one of our main events that counts for requirements for graduation. We are bringing two talent acquisition experts who will provide tips regarding the do's and don'ts on resumes and interviews. 
This would be a great opportunity to ask any question related to the topic. It will be an interactive, an interactive session. Uh, we will send a detailed email. A detailed email. Um, thank you very much, every, every, everybody. Have a good night and stay safe. Uh, yeah. Wait a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for everybody in the mentorship, I would like to send a polling question uh, for all of you to, if you can give me a second. Yeah. Yes, please, if you can answer this question, it will be very helpful for us. Thank you. So thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Andrew. Do you want to add anything else? All good? Thank you very much. Stay safe. Take care. Thanks. Bye.